Things were going poorly at the sewing factory. The equipment was outdated, and the old boss was apparently stealing, resulting in a constant shortage of materials and fittings. The owner lived in the capital, and he had been considering closing the unprofitable unit, but he felt sympathy for the workers. Being from a small town himself, he understood the difficulties of working in a remote area. To investigate the situation and determine the future prospects of the enterprise, the director decided to send his young deputy Alan to the countryside. In reality, it was more of an exile than a business trip, as punishment for Alan rejecting the director's daughter, who had shown a keen interest in him. Initially, the elderly businessman wanted to fire his deputy out of anger, but professionalism prevailed over emotions. Firstly, Alan had not done anything wrong. The heart cannot be commanded, and he was not obligated to love anyone, even if it was the boss's daughter. Secondly, finding such skilled specialists was like finding a needle in a haystack. Everyone wanted to earn a lot without putting in much effort, and truly valuable staff members were rare. And so, Alan found himself in this remote town. Being a native of the capital and accustomed to comfort since childhood, he was slightly shocked by the lifestyle and mentality of the people in the hinterland. He felt particularly uneasy due to the increased attention from the female population. The town was experiencing a decline in male residents, as young, strong men left, searching for better lives and higher incomes. Mostly women and girls remained, who teased Alan calling him an enviable groom from the capital. Therefore, Alan was not pleased with his temporary place of work, and on the first day he considered escaping. However, such an act would be unmanly and could jeopardise his career. Alan had aspirations to become the head of one of the branches of a clothing company, and the situation with the boss's daughter had shaken his position. If he refused the business trip now, it could be the end of his management career, and he would have to start from scratch at another company. On his first day of work at the new location, Alan woke up before dawn. He felt nervous about meeting his new subordinates and rehearsed his welcome speech in front of the mirror. After all, he wanted to establish his authority with the spirited ladies. However, upon entering the workshop, he forgot everything he had planned to say, Alan had a lump in his throat that prevented him from uttering a word. But the cause of his confusion was not the sound of female laughter or crude jokes. It was her. Standing a little apart from the crowd was a tall, slender girl. Unlike her colleagues, she was silent and somewhat aloof. She seemed uninterested in what was happening and paid no attention to the new boss. In truth, her heart was pounding wildly at that moment and countless thoughts swirled in her head. All she wanted was to slip away unnoticed, to avoid seeing this man, and to prevent him from recognising or noticing her. But he did recognise her, despite the passing of seven long years. During that time, Kelly had changed a lot. She had wrinkles at the corners of her eyes, and had cut off her once luxurious long hair. However, the intelligent gaze of her green eyes her bold expression, and the wrinkles on her nose remained unchanged. Alan could not have been mistaken. It was the same Kelly whom he had loved with all his heart, the one he had yearned for over the years and felt so deeply offended by. Kelly did not remember her mother and only knew her face from old photographs. Her mother had died in a car accident when the girl was just two years old. Overwhelmed with grief, Kelly's father didn't know how to go on, so he decided to move to the hometown to his mother. After all, the grandmother was the best person to care for an orphaned little girl. Mrs. McKay truly became a mother figure to Kelly during the early years of her life. However, when the girl turned six, her grandmother passed away from heart disease. They say the road to hell is paved with good intentions, and that was certainly the case this time. Before her death, Mrs. McKay did something foolishly kind for her son and granddaughter, as she thought. She had long been eyeing Brenda, a young widow who lived on a neighbouring street. 
the elderly woman believed there was no better candidate to be her son's wife. Brenda was beautiful, hard-working, decent-looking, and most importantly, childless. Mrs. McKay saw that as a crucial factor. She believed that since Brenda had no children of her own, she would surely love Kelly and would never deprive her of anything. And for John, Brenda would be a loyal wife, as she had not met anyone else in the five years since her husband's death. She's not slutty. That's good, Mrs. K reasoned. On her deathbed, as her last will, the elderly woman ordered her son to marry Brenda. By nature, John was a weak-willed man who did not know how to fight with circumstances and always swam with the flow. For him it was important to have someone near, to have the house cleaned and cooked, and to have his daughter under supervision. Well, why not Brenda? John thought. After all, she is a beautiful, strong woman. Although she was a bit older than him, such conventions never bothered him. Besides, after John's mother died, Brenda volunteered to help him with his daughter and began to visit him to clean up, cook and play with the girl. At first, she came to John once every three or four days, but then she started visiting more often and eventually moved into his house. This transition happened so naturally and unobtrusively that John didn't even notice how Brenda went from being a simple neighbour to almost a full-fledged member of the family. John didn't even have to propose marriage to her. Brenda herself initiated the conversation and took care of all the bureaucratic matters. However, once the signatures were in place and the rings were exchanged, the situation in the house changed drastically. Having become John's lawful wife and mistress of the house, Brenda transformed from a woman into a real fury. However, this change mainly affected Kelly, who now had a wicked stepmother, just like in Cinderella's fairy tale. Brenda often shouted at the girl unnecessarily and burdened her with household chores that were beyond her age. If Kelly failed to do something, Brenda scolded her harshly and punished her by putting her in a corner. Eventually, she even started physically abusing her. At first, Kelly sought protection from her father, her only family member. John was deeply outraged when he learned that his new wife was exploiting and abusing his only daughter. However, when he confronted Brenda about it, she completely turned the situation around. Of course, Kelly doesn't love me. She is jealous of you. That's why she's making up bad stories about me. You have no idea how she torments me or the intrigues she creates while you're at work. But I endure it all. I don't scold the poor orphan and I don't complain to you. And now you come and accuse me of all mortal sins. Brenda, sobbing uncontrollably, collapsed onto the sofa and John, bewildered, rushed to comfort her. I'm sorry, darling. Oh, I swear Kelly will get what she deserves for deceiving me, he nervously repeated, stroking his weeping wife's shoulder. Kelly was watching this scene through the slightly open living room door, realised that her father would not support her and that she would have to endure the abuse from her stepmother. That's why Kelly had no happy memories of her childhood. In her own home, she became a servant, endlessly cleaning scrubbing and doing other chores. She had no time to play outside, so she had no friends. Kelly only left the house to go to the grocery store or the market, and her stepmother dressed her in such rags that children would laugh and adults would shake their heads sympathetically. When Kelly started school, her stepmother didn't allow her much time to do her homework. As a result, the girl received bad grades despite being quite intelligent. Over time, John began to notice that something was wrong, but Brenda was skilled in sensing his mood and would act like the most caring stepmother in his presence. In these moments, she treated Kelly so affectionately that not every biological mother could match her tenderness. Although John sensed the falseness of his wife, he chose to push his doubts away. Okay, I'll kick her out of the house, he thought. But then what? 
Who will take care of the house, raise the child? It's better to leave things as they are. Amidst all this hopelessness, Kelly found solace in one thing. While rummaging through the attic, she discovered a dusty chest filled with various books on cutting and sewing, as well as beautiful but faded fabric remnants. These treasures belonged to her grandmother, who used to enjoy sewing when she was young. Kelly began studying these books and eventually picked up a needle and thread. Whenever her stepmother was out of the house or napping after dinner, the girl would rush to the attic and immerse herself in the magical world of patterns and fabric. Once, when Brenda went to the market, Kelly, as usual, began working on her needlework. Unfortunately, halfway through, her stepmother's heel broke, so she returned home to change her shoes. It was then that she noticed the house was quiet and started calling for her stepdaughter. When she received no response, Brenda thought to herself, What a lazy girl! She must have run off somewhere! Suddenly, she noticed that the door to the attic was open, and the ladder, which usually stood elsewhere, was in front of her. When she went upstairs, Brenda saw Kelly, who was working on a piece of cloth and humming a song quietly. It was difficult to understand why the girl's hobby made Brenda so angry. She was generally irritated by everything related to the girl and tried to make her unhappy in every possible way. Without hesitation, the woman snatched the fabric and patterns from her stepdaughter's hands and took them outside. Then she returned and took the books from the trunk. No matter how much Kelly screamed, no matter how much she cried, she could not save her treasure. Brenda burned everything in the middle of the yard. However, Kelly managed to save one brochure with patterns of dresses. She safely hid it in her room and would look at it in the evenings. Yes, the girl was deprived of her favourite hobby, but now she clearly understood what she wanted to do in the future and what profession she desired. Kelly eagerly anticipated graduating from school because it meant she could enrol in a sewing school and escape from her repressive stepmother and indifferent father. The dream of learning and living a free life warmed Kelly and helped her endure Brenda's bullying. In turn, the woman constantly undermined the stepdaughter's composure. She was aware of Kelly's plans and would often say to the girl, "'You won't succeed at anything. You won't achieve anything. You will continue to live here and serve me.' But the time came and Kelly realised her plans. Usually people feel homesick when they leave their hometowns, but the girl felt relief at leaving the place where her childhood had been spent. The farther the bus took her away from her father's house, the lighter her soul felt. Of course, she was a little guilty about leaving her dad with this nasty woman, but ultimately, he had made his own choice. Now Kelly had to build her own life. Luckily, the girl inherited her mother's determination and ambition. Instead of studying somewhere nearby, she decided to study in the capital. She understood that it wouldn't be easy to get in, and that the cost of living in the capital was high. However, the big city offered great opportunities, with plenty of work and good wages. There was a chance she could stay there after her studies, and not return to her father's house with the cruel stepmother. Upon arriving in the city, Kelly was lucky. She enrolled in a sewing school, and was able to move into a dormitory almost immediately. Initially, she couldn't help but feel happy about her newfound freedom, about no longer being hurt, humiliated, or forced into hard domestic labour. Most importantly, Kelly finally had friends. It was something new and incredibly pleasant for her to have heartfelt communication and share secrets with others. However, the euphoria of city life soon faded, and Kelly had to face the harsh reality. She quickly realised that she needed to find a job. At first, Kelly and her friends tried to earn money through their main craft, sewing and mending clothes. They advertised their services on social networks and waited for orders. Unfortunately, the orders didn't pour in as they had hoped. Occasionally, someone would ask them to alter an old dress or skirt, 
but the payment was meagre. One day, on her way back from school, Kelly saw an ad for waiters at a nearby cafe. She decided that this was accurately what she needed. She deviated from her usual path, halfway to the dormitory, turned onto another street and went to the address. Since the cafe manager was present, Kelly was able to pass the interview right away and get hired. Thus, Kelly's working life began. Combining work and study turned out to be a challenging task. To keep up with everything, the girl had to sacrifice her sleep. But while Kelly's friends constantly lamented and complained about the hardships of life, she paid no attention to the difficulties. For her, even these challenges were a source of happiness compared to her life under the same roof as her stepmother Brenda. But soon, fate had a surprise in store for Kelly as a reward for her steadfastness and patience. The girl noticed that almost every day a group of well-dressed, polite students would come to the cafe at the same time. They would take a table by the window, order pizza or desserts, and engage in discussions related to student life. One guy with blonde hair stood out from the rest of the company. Kelly was attracted to him because of his funny round glasses, slightly old-fashioned style of clothing and shy behaviour. She heard that his name was Alan. This went on for about six months. Kelly would carry trays while stealing glances at Alan. Eventually, she realised that she had developed feelings for him, and these feelings grew stronger every day. However, Kelly was a realist and didn't believe in fairy tales like Cinderella. Based on Alan's appearance and manners, she assumed that he came from a wealthy family and would never pay attention to a poor waitress from a village. But how wrong she was... Kelly had low self-esteem, which was understandable. She didn't have a loving mother who raised and taught her to value herself. Her beloved grandmother passed away at a young age, and her stepmother would often insult her, calling her names like ugly, scarecrow, and even worse. The ridicule from her peers also didn't help boost her confidence. Therefore, Kelly was not accustomed to seeing herself as a beautiful and charming girl, despite having a very nice and noble appearance. However, Alan was attracted by this pretty waitress with her big eyes and long braids right away. But due to his natural shyness, he didn't dare to admit his feelings. Instead, he would just steal glances at the girl he liked. Nevertheless, one day, he finally gathered the courage to take a bold step. After Kelly finished her shift, Alan approached her and offered to walk her home. Overwhelmed in surprise and excitement, she couldn't find the words to respond, so she simply nodded. The young couple slowly walked along the night streets, illuminated by the light of lanterns and store windows. The journey from the cafe to Kelly's dormitory took about half an hour, and during that time, they remained awkwardly silent. When it was time to say goodbye, Alan mustered the courage to ask, May I walk you home again tomorrow? Kelly nodded and headed towards the dormitory. That night, Kelly couldn't sleep. She pondered over what had happened, restlessly tossing and turning in bed. Her roommate even threw into her a pillow, expressing her annoyance at being disturbed. To avoid bothering her friend any further, Kelly decided to go out into the corridor and walked towards the large mirror hanging on the wall near the stairs. For the first time in her life, she looked at herself as a beautiful young girl who could fall in love. Unlike other girls, Kelly wasn't in the habit of fussing in front of the mirror or dressing up. Perhaps her stepmother's words had deeply affected her self-esteem, causing her to perceive herself as plain and uninteresting. But now, the reflection showed a completely unfamiliar girl who could easily be featured in movies or grace the covers of expensive magazines. Why not? Maybe he's my prince, my destiny, thought Kelly, deciding to give her relationship with Alan a chance. Of course, she was a little concerned about the difference in social status and wealth, but in the 21st century, does it really matter? And so, the beautiful and intoxicating romance between Alan and Kelly began. They met in secret, keeping their relationship private. 
Kelly even quit her job at the cafe and found another one so that Alan wouldn't feel awkward when coming with friends to their favourite place. In her youthful inexperience, she didn't understand why her boyfriend was so afraid of others finding out about their relationship. She was too blinded by her happiness and didn't have time to think. However, over time, Kelly began to feel a bit uneasy about the fact that Alan never introduced her to his friends. She was acquainted with all her friends' boyfriends, and after a year and a half of dating Alan, she thought that was a perfectly acceptable amount of time to get to know his friends and even his parents. Kelly decided that she needed to have a serious conversation with Alan about this. But just as she was about to start the conversation, her beloved surprised her in such a way that all doubts and resentments disappeared. He gave her a gold ring with a pink stone and proposed marriage. Kelly melted with joy and immediately accepted his proposal. For a few days, she forgot about her concerns, thinking that Alan would finally introduce her to his friends and family. However, nothing changed. The doubts crept back, and Kelly began to wonder if her metropolitan groom was simply taking advantage of her and didn't have serious intentions. Maybe he had bought the ring just to distract her. After all, it wasn't a significant expense for him. Then Kelly realised that she couldn't avoid an unpleasant conversation and decided not to postpone it any longer. So, on their second date, she expressed everything that had been building up in her heart to Alan. Alan, be honest, are you fooling me? You asked me to marry you, but I don't feel like you're serious about it. If you're not serious, it's better to tell me now, and let's part ways amicably. How on earth did you come to such a conclusion? Do I look like that kind of person? exclaimed Alan, his face flushed with indignation and resentment. What am I supposed to think? We've been together for almost two years, but I haven't even met your friends. You're going to marry me, but it seems like your family doesn't know about it. Or are we going to get married secretly? Alan couldn't find the words to respond. Indeed, from Kelly's perspective, his secrecy and indecision seemed suspicious. But in order to not lose the person he loved, he had to confess that he was simply afraid of his mother. Kelly looked at her beloved with surprise and a hint of distrust in her eyes, and he told her what was going on. The thing was, Alan's mother came from a noble background. Mrs. Rainey was the great-granddaughter of a nobleman and was incredibly proud of it. From a young age, she was obsessed with her aristocratic heritage and looked down upon ordinary people. When Alan was a child, he constantly suffered because of his mother's aristocratic ways. She didn't allow him to make friends or play with his peers in the neighbourhood. While other boys were playing soccer and climbing trees, Alan was forced to attend tutors and improve his piano skills. The neighbourhood children teased and mocked him without realising how much he was suffering. When Alan entered a prestigious university, he finally had the opportunity to make friends, as his mother deemed the crowd there suitable. Now he found himself caught between two fires. On one hand, he loved Kelly and didn't want to lose her. On the other hand, introducing her to his mother would lead to a disaster. However, there was no way out. Alan couldn't hide his fiancée from his mother forever, and they would eventually have to meet. And since Kelly was so concerned about it, it had to happen in the nearest future. The conversation between the young people ended on a tense note. They didn't see each other for a few days, and then Alan called Kelly and invited her to his home to meet his mother. The girl felt both pleased and frightened, because she had already imagined his mother as a difficult person. She also felt a little ashamed for accusing Alan of insincerity, but what was done was done. Now, it was important not to make a bad impression in front of Mrs. Rainey, Kelly's friends were so heartened by her problem that they all worked together to prepare Kelly for this important dinner. The girls brought their best outfits and jewellery to create an image that would be suitable for meeting an aristocratic family. In the end, 
Kelly dressed simply but tastefully. She wore a monochrome grey dress with a straight cut and patent boot shoes, which made her look quite elegant. At least in this outfit no one would mistake her for a villager or a student at a sewing school. But despite her stylish outfit, Kelly couldn't hide her lack of self-confidence. She trembled and her hands shook as she imagined the worst scenarios for the meeting. For some reason she believed that Mrs. Rainey would immediately criticise her and treat her poorly. But things turned out differently. Mrs. Rainey greeted Kelly in a friendly, almost overly friendly manner. The dinner proceeded in a warm and relaxed atmosphere. Alan's mother showered Kelly with compliments, asking her about her childhood and her studies as a seamstress, and listened attentively to her answers. She shared a lot about her son, and even showed his childhood photos. And why did Alan speak so badly about his mother? She's such a nice woman, thought Kelly, looking at her beloved, who sat there tense and clearly not sharing her calmness. But little did Kelly know about the huge scandal that Mrs. Rainey had caused for her son the day before. When the woman found out that her son had a lover whom he intended to marry, she almost fainted. But when she learned that the girl came from the middle of nowhere and was studying to be a seamstress, her fainting spell was replaced by an inhuman rage. Mrs. Rainey, accustomed to her son always obeying her unquestioningly, spoke at length, shouting and even having a hysterical fit. Just imagine an ugly commoner is audaciously trying to enter our aristocratic family. Alan listened to his mother in silence and then declared, I'm going to marry Kelly anyway. If you don't accept her, we will secretly do it without your permission and go away from this city to the village. Of course, Alan had no intention of going to any village. This threat was just his way of trying to influence his mother. After all, she had no one but him, and the thought of losing him terrified her. The manipulation seemed to work. Alan's words had a strong impact on Mrs. Rainey. For about half an hour, the mother and son silently stared at each other, and then they began a tense but calm conversation without raising their voices. Now, Mrs. Rainey listened calmly to Alan and even expressed a desire to meet her future daughter-in-law. Alan felt something was off about his mother's quick change of heart, and when she warmly and cordially met Kelly, it only made him more anxious. As Alan accompanied his fiance back to the dormitory after dinner, she reproached him, saying, "'I don't understand how you could speak so badly about your mother. You scared me, and she turned out to be such a nice woman.' Alan couldn't find anything to say in response, so he just smiled foolishly. He knew there was something behind his mother's seemingly good intentions, but he couldn't figure out what it was yet. Days passed, but Mrs. Rainey's mood remained unchanged. She continued to exude calmness, and Alan gradually calmed down. The lovers continued to enjoy their happiness as if nothing had happened, unaware of what awaited them. One evening, while Kelly and her dorm mates were engaged in evening gossip, there was a knock on the door. Standing in the doorway was a stunningly beautiful, expensively dressed blonde, who appeared to be around 25 years old. She arrogantly and somewhat disdainfully surveyed the modest room and its occupants, then asked, "'May I see Kelly? I need to talk to her.' Kelly was surprised and didn't immediately realise that the stranger had come to see her. She and her guest went out into the corridor and headed to the kitchen, where no one else was at this time. Kelly's mind was full of questions. "'Who is this girl?' How did she know her, and what did she want? But Kelly did not dare to start a conversation. After a couple of minutes, the stranger broke the awkward silence and introduced herself as Heather. Kelly looked at the girl with confusion, indicating that the name meant nothing to her. Suddenly, the mask of cold arrogance fell, and Heather burst into tears, grabbing Kelly's hands and begging her not to separate the child from his father. Kelly couldn't understand. What 
the uninvited guest wanted from her. What child? What father? It was difficult to make out Heather's words through her sobs, but after a couple of minutes she calmed down a little and explained everything in detail. Heather claimed to have a fiancé whom she had been with for many years. They had known each other since childhood because their families were friends. They were planning to get married, but at some point Heather's fiancé grew distant, paid less attention to her, and decided to postpone their wedding. Heather realised her lover was cheating on her and had already made up her mind to break off the engagement when she found out she was pregnant. Please, understand, I didn't come to you for myself, but for the sake of the child. I don't want him to grow up without a father. Please, have mercy on us, Heather tearfully pleaded. I don't understand. What does this have to do with me? Go sort things out with your fiancé. How can I help? Kelly asked, puzzled. Don't play dumb. You knew exactly who I was talking about. Alan, he is my fiancé and the father of my child who you stole from me. Heather burst out, proudly raised her head, and then turned and left, leaving Kelly alone with this shocking revelation. At first, everything the stranger said seemed like complete nonsense to Kelly. Some secret affair, a pregnant bride abandoned. No, honest, decent and shy Alan couldn't be involved in anything like that. But, on the other hand... Why would this well-groomed, smartly-dressed girl come to a dormitory on the outskirts of the city if it was all a lie? She cried so sincerely, it didn't seem like she was making it up. In a moment of realisation, Kelly hurried down the stairs, hoping to catch up with Heather. She had many questions to ask, but time was not on her side. When Kelly reached the street, she saw that Heather had already gotten into her expensive red car and driven away. All that she could do was watch the dimming taillights until the car disappeared around the corner. Left alone with her thoughts, Kelly tried to process the information she had received. The more she pondered, the clearer the picture became in her mind. Now she understood why Alan had been so hesitant, why he had kept her a secret from his friends and his mother. It turned out that all this time he had been leading a double life deceiving both her and his fiance Heather. He had also spun tales about being afraid of his mother, painting a false image of this kind woman. Consumed by anger and resentment, Kelly nervously paced the dormitory corridors. She didn't even notice her concerned friends who surrounded her, asking what had happened. Moments ago, her entire world had come crashing down, shattering all her dreams and future plans. As the initial wave of anger subsided, Kelly regained her composure and immediately reached for her phone. She wanted to call Alan and demand an explanation, but then she changed her mind. She decided it would be better to wait until morning, confront him at the university, and lay everything bare, looking him in the eyes. However, after contemplating the situation further, her pride ignited. Kelly decided that she would later regret multiple times. But at that moment, it felt like the right thing to do. The next morning, Kelly feigned a headache and didn't go to school. Once her friends had left, she got out of bed and started packing her belongings. During the night, she had resolved that she didn't want to stay in the same city as Alan, never wanting to cross paths with him again. True, she didn't have the guts to throw away a few nice trinkets that her lover had given her, the girl squeamishly turned them in her hands and then threw them into the suitcase with deliberate disdain. Once everything was packed, Kelly sat on the bed and contemplated her next move. During the night, she had chosen to leave the capital. With minimal savings, she couldn't afford to simply move to another city and start anew. Returning home to her town seemed to be the only option. Of course, the thought of living under the same roof as her wicked stepmother Brenda terrified the girl, and she also understood that abandoning her studies, when she was so close to obtaining her diploma, would be foolish. However, pride and resentment overpowered her common sense. Leaving the dormitory 
with her suitcase in hand, Kelly glanced back at the dull grey building that was her home for a while. Then she took a deep breath and headed toward the train station. By lunchtime the following day, she arrived at her hometown and approached the gates of her family home, without notifying anyone of her return. Kelly hesitated on the threshold for a moment before knocking loudly on the door. Her father, visibly aged, during her absence, greeted her with joy in his eyes. However, his attempt to embrace her was halted by a harsh female voice calling out from the back of the room. "'Who's there?' Moments later, Brenda appeared at the threshold, wearing a gaudy, colourful dress and holding a dirty kitchen towel. The expression on her face upon seeing her stepdaughter was a mix of surprise and displeasure that words couldn't fully describe. She gave Kelly a brief glance before inviting her inside. Carrying her suitcase, Kelly made her way to her room, which, to her surprise, still retained its original appearance. She had expected her stepmother to have cleaned it out and thrown away all her belongings. In reality, Brenda had planned to do so, but she hadn't gotten around to it yet. You haven't thought about us for so long, and now you suddenly decided to visit us. What's wrong all of a sudden? Brenda asked. No reason. I'm tired of Big City and missed home, Kelly replied. Well, how long will you stay with us? Probably not for long, Brenda continued her questioning. We'll see. Maybe forever, the stepdaughter answered before closing herself in her room, wanting to avoid any further unpleasant conversation. Of course, Brenda was extremely dissatisfied with Kelly's return. She had grown accustomed to being the sole mistress of the house, and had practically convinced John to sign over the house only to her. With the arrival of her stepdaughter, she knew this wouldn't be possible any more. On the other hand, she was pleased that Kelly's time in the capital hadn't worked out, and that she had returned to her father's house with her head down. That was the kind of person Brenda was. She liked finding joy in other people's troubles, and energised by their misfortunes. As Kelly anticipated, her stepmother made her life in her father's house a living hell. She would daily mock her, reproach her, and call her a failure, saying, So you didn't conquer the capital, and didn't turn into a young lady of the capital, did you? But that was just the beginning compared to what happened later. In fact, Kelly had been experiencing bouts of vomiting from various strong smells for about a month, but for some reason she had not paid attention to it. Additionally, recent events had made the girl completely forget about her well-being. However, a few weeks after returning home, Kelly began to feel unpleasant symptoms again. She felt ill during breakfast, and Brenda immediately realised what was wrong. She didn't need any tests to know that her stepdaughter was pregnant. Realising the reason behind Kelly's unexpected return, Brenda felt a sense of triumph. Now she had the perfect excuse to endlessly reproach and torment the girl. But first she decided to create a big scandal. She put her hands on her head and shouted that Kelly had brought shame upon her and her father in front of the whole town. How are we supposed to face people? We sent our daughter to study and she pulls a stunt like this. Even John, who had never known any interest in his daughter and remained silent when the stepmother abused her, suddenly supported his wife and began reproaching Kelly for her shamelessness. Brenda, supposedly fearing shame, quickly spread the news of Kelly's pregnancy throughout the town. She spread rumours with all sorts of nonsense, fueling gossip. Within a couple of days, all the women in town were already talking about how Kelly had gotten involved with a married rich man in the capital and had become pregnant by him. When the man's legitimate wife found out about the affair, she grabbed Kelly by the hair and gave her husband an ultimatum. It's either me or her. The rich man, valuing his wife more, refused his mistress. Left with no choice, Kelly had to bid farewell to her glamorous life in the capital and return to her humble life with cows and chickens. At first, Kelly was furious 
and upset by these rumors. She tried to defend herself and argued with those who loved to gossip. But soon she realized it was pointless. What could she possibly bring against all those slanderers? Brenda's story seemed very believable from an outsider's perspective. Furthermore, to the people from her little town, who lived rather dull and monotonous lives, such a story was a breath of fresh air. For the next few months, they had something to talk about, and each day, new, fictional details emerged. With time, Kelly accepted what was happening, and stopped arguing with anyone. Besides, she now had thoroughly different concerns. She needed to think about how to live on, how to provide for herself, because now she was responsible not only for herself, but also for the child. In addition, Brenda constantly reproached her stepdaughter for being a healthy girl who relied on her parents and didn't work anywhere. But who would hire her? Who would want to employ someone who was about to go on maternity leave? And there weren't many options in Kelly's town. There wasn't much work available, except a small sewing factory that had opened a few years ago. Kelly didn't expect to be hired, but she decided to try her luck. In the personnel department, she was greeted by a woman who looked to be about 50, 55 years old. Seeing the woman's stern and haughty face, along with her high, formal hairstyle, Kelly thought her chances weren't good at all, that this woman wouldn't hire her. However, during the interview, it turned out that the woman was kind and understanding. In her youth, she had been in a similar situation, so she understood how it was to be left alone and without support. Out of sympathy, she gave Kelly a job, although not with much enthusiasm. Meanwhile, Kelly withdrew into herself and didn't interact with anyone. She resented the residents who chose to believe Brenda's stories. However, they in turn felt no remorse and didn't attempt to communicate with Kelly. And even when the gossip died down, the town women still avoided her. Nevertheless, Kelly found solace in her work. Despite the judgmental looks from her colleagues, she felt calm and free at the factory. But at home, Brenda gave her a real hell. Every day the woman scandalized her stepdaughter, calling her all sorts of names. She mocked Kelly, her failures, then reproached that because of her in the house there would be no peace because the baby would soon be born and he would scream for days and nights. And what was most offensive, Kelly had no arguments left to oppose her stepmother. She could no longer look at Brenda with her head held high because she understood perfectly well that from now on she had nowhere to go and she would have to live here and be in the service of this nasty woman without any hope for a bright future. Soon Kelly gave birth to a son whom she named Alan after her former lover. Although she could never forgive his despicable act, she found herself thinking less and less about his betrayal and more about the happy moments they had shared, especially when she looked at her baby. It surprised her how much he resembled his father, and she decided that no other name would suit her child. There was a fleeting moment when she considered informing Alan that he had a son, but pride overcame her emotions, and she decided to leave everything as it was. After the birth of her child, Kelly seemed to blossom. Motherhood suited her well, and she became more calm and balanced. She no longer reacted to Brenda's reproaches and teasing, which only made her stepmother angrier. It was hurtful for Kelly to hear Brenda call her child fatherless, and she even had the urge to scratch the face of this insolent woman. However, she resolved to remain strong and not show her true emotions to anyone. When the child turned one and a half years old, Kelly got him into the kindergarten and returned to work at the factory. She worked with great enthusiasm and dedication, often receiving bonuses, which greatly irritated her co-workers. Not only did she irritate her female colleagues, but she also drew the attention of all the men in the town community. There was no trace of the Kelly who returned from the capital with a downcast gaze and slouched shoulders. She appeared more confident and attractive, and naturally, she began to have suitors. However, Kelly did not reciprocate or accept any advances. 
Some persistent suitors even approached her father to ask for her hand in marriage, but she rejected them with a scandal and eventually discouraged all suitors. The locals believed she was crazy and started to gossip once again. They couldn't understand why this single mother refused to get married. They thought she should be grateful that someone wanted to take her and her child. Little did they realise that Kelly had no need for suitors or husbands. After her experience with Alan, she no longer trusted men and believed that no one else could love her as much. Furthermore, Kelly couldn't comprehend why she should marry someone in town if she had no intention of staying there. Her dream was to eventually move to the city so that her son could attend a good school and eventually go to college. Additionally, she didn't want Alan to continue growing up under the same roof as the witch-like Brenda, who constantly mistreated him and tried to influence him negatively. Unfortunately, fulfilling her dream of moving was not easy. The salary at the sewing factory was quite low, to say the least, and raising a child required money. To achieve her goal, Kelly made sacrifices and saved every penny she could. Finally, the moment arrived when Kelly realised that she was ready to move, that she had saved enough money to pay several months' rent for an apartment in the city in advance. It was at this very moment that a fateful meeting took place. When Kelly saw Alan in front of her, she panicked. She did not know how to react to his appearance, as she both hated and continued to love him. But why was he giving her that cold and arrogant look, as if she were guilty of something? She wanted to disappear or hide somewhere, just to avoid meeting Alan's eyes. Taking advantage of the chaos, when the workers started bombarding the new boss with questions, she quickly fled the workshop and went home, claiming to be ill. Of course, Alan immediately noticed Kelly's escape. He had been angry with her all these years, and now his anger grew even stronger. Well, she can't run forever, can she? Not today, but maybe tomorrow or the day after, I'll finally face her and ask her about abandoning me so cowardly seven years ago. Meanwhile, Kelly ran home, locked herself in her room, and cried until evening. For so many years, she had tried to be strong and keep her emotions in check. But with such an unexpected encounter with her past love, all the negativity accumulated over seven years overwhelmed her. In the evening, little Alan suddenly developed a fever. They had to call a doctor. Naturally, Kelly couldn't go to work the next morning, so she stayed with her son. She informed her boss that she would be on sick leave for the next few days. Meanwhile, Alan was already at the factory. He couldn't focus on work at all. He was waiting for Kelly to come. Well, for obvious reasons, she didn't show up. Pretending to be a strict boss, he started questioning why one of the workers was absent. When he heard that she was on sick leave, he didn't believe it. He was convinced that Kelly was just avoiding him. Suddenly, one of the employees said, She has a sick child, so she won't be here for a few days. Hearing about the child, Alan became even angrier. So, while I suffered years of loneliness, she wasted no time. She got married and had a child? At that moment, he had no idea of the revelations that lay ahead. While working, the women liked to gossip and spread rumours. Since Kelly was absent that day, her colleagues decided to discuss her. When Alan realised that they were whispering about her, he eavesdropped on their conversations. They spoke in hushed tones, so he couldn't hear much, but he did learn some interesting things. He discovered that Kelly was not married, and it was unclear who the father of her child was. Suddenly, a thought flashed through Alan's mind. Could the child be his? But how could he find out how old the boy was? He couldn't ask people directly. He was still too shy and didn't want to give them cause for gossip. Finally, he decided he had to go to Kelly's house and talk to her face to face. He went to the personnel department and professionally requested the personnel files of the female employees from the workshop, which were not many. Finding Kelly's folder, 
he memorized her address and went to her after the end of the workday. On the way, Alan pondered what he would say to Kelly, how he would demand an explanation from her. However, when he reached the gate of the house and saw his beloved on the porch, he forgot everything. What happened next left him speechless. Suddenly, a mischievous little boy in blue pants and a green shirt ran out of the house and excitedly ran up to his mother, telling her something. Then the child saw a stranger standing at the gate and looked into his eyes intently. Suddenly the boy smiled, and with a joyful cry of, Daddy! rushed towards Alan. Kelly was confused and tried to hold the child, but it was too late. Now all the cards were on the table. It turned out that all these years, Kelly had kept a single photo of her and Alan together. They looked happy in the photo, so she couldn't bring herself to tear it up or throw it away. When the boy grew up and started asking about his dad, Kelly showed him the picture. Of course she couldn't tell her son about the betrayal, so she simply said that his father was far away, but some day he would definitely come. Now Kelly realised that she couldn't delay it any longer and that they needed to talk. She took her son by the hand and led him into the house, then returned to talk to Alan, who seemed shocked. They walked away from the house and into a linden grove, where no one would see or hear them. Alan was the first to break the silence with a question. How could you hide my child from me? Just as you could hide your pregnant fiancé from me, blurted out Kelly, turning away resentfully. They began to shower each other with reproaches, until they realised how they had been deceived. Alan swore that he didn't know, and had never known anyone named Heather, but based on the description, she resembled Monica, the daughter of his mother's best friend. Apparently his mother had orchestrated this whole performance to get rid of her unwanted daughter-in-law, and it worked. True, she later scolded herself repeatedly for making her son unhappy, because he never loved anyone else, or built a new relationship after Kelly left. On her deathbed she repented for what she had done, but couldn't confess everything to her son. Once everything became clear, Kelly felt extremely ashamed of how foolish and inconsiderate she had acted seven years ago. It was terrifying to think that because of her foolish pride, she had deprived herself of the man she loved, and left her son without a father. If she had called Alan back then, everything would have turned out differently. But the past couldn't be undone, and old mistakes couldn't be corrected. Now they had to think about the future and find a way to rebuild their relationship. Alan was angry and resentful towards Kelly. He couldn't forgive her for those lost years, so for some time he didn't speak to her. However, he visited his son every day and spent a lot of time with him. Additionally, he had to face Kelly at work, and at some point their old feelings reignited with renewed vigour, overshadowing their past grievances. Seven years later, the lovers reunited, giving people something new to gossip about. The locals, who knew nothing about Alan and Kelly's relationship, came up with all sorts of stories. But the happy couple didn't care at all. Soon they quit their jobs and left with their son to build a happy life in a new city where nothing reminded them of the sorrows they had experienced in the past. <laughs>